What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first awesomeo.com premium video. Well, the first you are seeing, we did one last week with the man on the other end of the line. Unfortunately, my laptop couldn't handle the genius that was coming out of the number one player in the world, Mr. Alex Baker, better known to a lot of you as Awesomeo. Alex, say hi to the people. Hey, man. Yeah, uh, that kind of reminds me of that Tenacious D song, Tribute. Like, we made the greatest <laughs> video of all time. But we'll, we'll try to do one that's pretty good today, too. It was good. It was like, the, the sucky part, too, was like it cut off eight minutes in. My computer just, like, doesn't have the processing powder. Thanks, Apple, for Mac Minis being like that. And um, at the end of the video, Alex was very complimentary, and it just died. It just went into the ember. <laughs> fires. But we'll try and get that out of you again tonight. Um, <laughs> Alex. Wish. Um, so, <laughs> that's true. Compliments are hard to come by for me yeah, always. Um, Alex, you're the top EFS player in the world. Um, you've made a ton of money doing this. That's not a, a brag. That's just a statement of fact, and I'll say it for you. Um, Alex <laughs> is one of the best players in the world, a very smart guy. What made you want to go from being just a player to having this media brand where you're now giving your own information out? Um, you're trying to help get people to be pro level like you. Um, what spurred you on to take that choice? So uh, That's a great question. It kind of came from going to all these live finals and meeting all the players who do DFS. And I found there's a lot of people who are really passionate about the game. But they're always like, I want to do what you do, but I work like 60 hours a week for a company. I don't have a, the time to do like full-time research. So that was kind of the idea behind Osmo.com is giving people who really care about fantasy sports and want to make it a sustainable hobby the tools to be able to do that and hopefully make some money too. So I guess one question that a lot of people have, and I've also had, you know, you're a pro and this as a site, we're trying to educate people to bring them up to a certain level to be that 538 of DFS that we talk about so much. Um, what do you think is the biggest mistake you as a pro see like a new player making in terms of, you know, anything that's important to you, bankroll, lineup construction, what stands out to you is something that people just mess up a lot. I think the biggest mistake is relying too much on recent data. In some sports, people do it more than others. Like football, people aren't riding the hot hand quite as much because there's psychologically kind of a different thing when it's like a week apart versus like the next day. So what ends up happening in basketball, baseball, is some guy will go on a hot streak and people will see it on Sports Center top 10 and that guy will be the guy they're thinking about when they're like clicking on DraftKings or FanDuel or Playline the next day. Um, so they're going to be very popular in those games. And also the price has usually gone up with the hot streak to kind of account for the recent performance. So those guys tend to be over-owned and people over-exaggerate the amount, uh, of luck or I mean of skill that goes into it and kind of discount the luck factor. So then to work in one a Twitter question from a follower of ours, and this is something we're going to do every week when I do these videos with Alex, is we're going to try to field your guys' questions and get to a couple of the really juicy ones. Um, this one came through from a guy, and I guess it ties into that topic. What's the mindset of a pro DFS player when building his or her lineups? Um, it, what's the difference, you think, between how you look at it versus how an average guy who's maybe playing five lineups you know, in between a day job is doing it? I think... Uh... The big difference is I kind of have a strategy I'm planning to use across a, a whole season instead of just a slate. So the guys who are playing on a slate, it's kind of uh, irrelevant to kind of the approach I'm taking. So I'll kind of have my model and treat every player the same and not use a lot of bias coming into it. And so um, another difference is building 150 lineups. I don't really have to worry about well, uh, do I want to pick this guy or do I not? Because there's a lot of middle ground there. So usually I'm going to play, you know, like in baseball, probably uh, there are eight games tonight. I'll probably stack eight or more teams, have like uh, a distribution of like six, six different pitchers probably, and uh, kind of try to cover all those possibilities that you'd want to do if you're kind of building all the lineups by hand. So that fits another topic we wanted to talk about as kind of a high-level thing. And I guess you could talk about how it relates to this slate as well. But how do you approach, um, and this is something that came into from a couple guys, uh, Metal Burning is asked, and uh, Jim Bean, I think, too, was asking about it. Um, probably not the real Jim Bean. I don't think he <laughs> unearthed himself to ask a DFS question. But if he did, that'd be pretty dope. Um, how would you approach a mass multi-lineup approach? Like, 
How are you doing that tonight? Where do you kind of view the points that you have to hit? Uh, how do you protect yourself from the downsides? I mean, because I mean, people have seen, and I think honestly, people have asked, and, and across the industry, people like to critique. They see a guy who's like using a lineup where it's like, oh, this wasn't one you recommended. But for you, you're trying to cover a lot of possible outcomes. So how do you right. approach that? It's a great question. First of all, Jim Beam, thank you for being a member of Awesome. And the other guy, uh, Metal. He got us through a lot of tough times, so now we're trying to help him back. <laughs> yeah, I definitely owe a lot back to Jim Beam, so I'm happy to answer this question. Um, what was the question again? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just about max multi entering, like how do you approach it to kind of cover all your bases and your risk? And I guess like how do you cr deal with the people who criticize the fact like you know you had the nationals on a lineup, but you weren't necessarily we weren't pushing them as a site. But I mean for you, it's a matter of like hey, hey Matt Adams might go off tonight. I need to have him in a lineup. Right. So it really depends on the sport here because different sports have different levels of volatility. Like if uh, if we were doing tennis and Djokovic was on the slate or something, it's like that guy is gonna win. 99.9% .9 of the time in the first round, but that doesn't happen in like team sports hardly ever. So you got to kind of adjust for this volatility uh, by picking a lot of guys. Uh, so, I mean, the difference between me and some of the other guys is that I'll have the popular players in my lineup and some more contrarian plays, and I'll kind of have a different like mix of all of them. Uh, when other guys, they might decide, well, Strasburg is the pitcher tonight that's going to be like the most popular and also the most likely to succeed. Uh, so, I mean, people are pretty good at figuring out who the most likely guys to succeed are. And, and in baseball particularly, like they have all these team totals on every website, including ours. So it's like, you know the team that's going to be the most likely to go off. So right. I'll have and also it's the most likely to be owned. Right, exactly. So it's kind of, uh, you want to combine the likelihood a guy's going to go off, which is what we talk about in our articles and our projections and rankings. But you also want to add a little bit of the strategy of the game, which is accounting for ownership, kind of diversifying your portfolio so that uh, you can kind of have a lineup that's likely to hit on every night and not compete against yourself too much. Because I think another mistake that people will uh, make is they'll kind of go too hard on certain players, and then at the end of the night, like, a lot of times, it's like one dude is first through 10th or something, you know? And right. that's kind of a disaster uh, in terms of EV or expected value because you're beating yourself for first place nine times, which is, uh, that's definitely going to hurt your results in the long run. So, well, uh, one thing, obviously, we talk about a lot on the site as a premium member, people know, if you're, you're seeing this video, you're a premium member, so you have access. Our ownership projections are one of the better ones. I think, honestly, we do some of the best in the industry ownership projections, not to pump the horn of the company I work for or anything. <laughs> but, um, but I guess, how do you incorporate that when you're mass multi-answering lineups? How do you use those ownership pro uh, projections? How do you um, mitigate risk using them? Like, how do they work for you? So the ownership projections, I think, of course, I agree with you. The Osmo.com ones are the best. <laughs> Simply the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll use them different amounts in different contests. So, for example, a qualifier, the ownership is exceedingly important compared to your $3 GPP. And it also, uh, the high stakes games like a Thunderdome, the ownerships are a little bit different because people know who the best players are, but they haven't quite figured out how to get away from them. So you'll have guys that are like 80% owned or something. Like the Strasburg tonight, I wouldn't be surprised if he is like 70% owned or higher in the Thunderdome. So what I'll do is I'll look at uh, who's popping up the most in my projections and also in the ownership model. And that's the pivot point I like to uh, deviate on. So like Strasburg tonight, I know he's the best play, but I have uh, Paxton, Severino, and DeGrom. And I think they're all great plays. Maybe not quite as likely to succeed. So what I'll do is I'll figure out which of those is the most likely to be contrarian. And then that'll be my guy. The same with Stacks. Got it. I think that makes sense. And I think, too, you know, another thing we have on the site are your rankings. And they mm -hmm. show you a pretty good path to using, you know, different players. And another guy who's a B value 
maybe is going to have the same points projection, but can get you better value than a Strasburg might on this slate. Um, so, I mean, all the resources are there on the site, and they're the ones that Alex uses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are coming straight from my projections. Uh, pitchers, batters, there's a ton of volatility. So if you think a guy is going to be 70% owned, the chance that he's going to have enough points to win you a GPP probably isn't that high. So that's when you want to kind of look at other guys to, uh, to replace them. Right, and we've seen a couple of very popular pitchers within the last week get shelled. I mean, Sale got mm-hmm. shelled at a very high ownership Kershaw. I mean, players who you would think never get shelled have gotten shelled. So there's always a, a theory to going contrarian and, and avoiding the chalky guy that comes up that much. Um, so how do you, actually, one question we've gotten a lot, and I think this might be our last one. Um, I'll give you a chance just to give a, your general thoughts. If you want to have the Alex moment, you can have that at the end. Um, but one question people have asked a lot, how do you, you suggest to you use your rankings when they're building a lineup? Like, how do they account for, you know, structuring your A values, your B values? Like, what should they be really thinking about when they approach that? So the way the rankings are designed to be made is you kind of have your lineup uh, already partially built. You know, you have like five or six guys and you're trying to figure out, well, who are the other four guys I want to plug in my lineup? So that's when you kind of bring in the salary, the value. Um, really, the best way to create a lineup is to pick the A value guys. Uh, as long as you're able to spend all your salary, that's going to be the highest scoring lineup on average. Of course, you also want to bring up the ownership projections if you're in a GPP and kind of pick guys that are good value, good points grade, that are going to be low owned. So uh, if you're going to take it to the next level, you want to find the contrarian picks and the rankings and uh, focus on those. Cool. All right. So I think that covers all my questions for today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be doing this video once a week with Alex, where he's going to give us some time, hopefully with enough time to get back to his lineups and adjust so we don't cost him thousands of dollars a day. <laughs> uh, but only in salary. That's the hope. Now. <laughs> uh, Thousands, the thousands of dollars are worth it to, to be able to do <laughs> these videos. <laughs> it's a real feel good moment to close out on. Thanks for your time, Alex. We appreciate it. We'll see you guys next week. Um, this is for premium members only, so don't share the link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. But yeah, no, we're, we're doing this as much as we can. Tweet me at Chris Bags. Tweet at Osmo underscore com if you have any questions that you want to hit up in a future episode. Make sure to follow at Osmo, A-W-E-S-E-M-O-D-F-S on Twitter and Instagram. Are you on Instagram yet? Are we, have we gotten you doing that yet? I don't really do much DFS Instagramming, but I am on there, so feel free okay, to follow Okay, so he's me. on there. If you want to slide into those DMs, <laughs> you can do that too. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Uh-